Hey everybody, Prince here. This is a quote-unquote quick review for Ring of Honor's 19th anniversary pay-per-view. The pay-per-view happened this past Friday night, uh, March 26th. I checked out a majority of the show on Sunday night, and then I finished it on Monday morning. Uh, it's currently Wednesday. I'm going to get around to reviewing this as quick as possible. And uh, overall, I thought this pay-per-view was good. Um, I would say it's about a step down from Final Battle. Um, that show had a much more consistent card from time excuse me, from top to bottom, but I think this show had some good matches, uh, worth checking out, uh, a couple of, uh, really good to borderline great matches worth checking out, um, I haven't been following the TV product for the last couple months since, like, the crit, or since the pandemic episode they did on New Year's Day, um, but I'm gonna try to get around to watching all the episodes to kind of fill in the blanks of, uh, a lot of the build-up to this show, because Ring of Honor, if there was a complaint I had with this show, even though they've done a good job doing these, I feel like that video packages on the pay-per-view would have really helped out. And I know that there are a lot of them available on YouTube right now and on their uh, weekly program, uh, Week by Week, which they do every Tuesday. But I feel like for those who haven't been following the product for the last couple of months, it would have helped to put um, video packages on the pay-per-view. But I think because they had nine matches on the main card and they only had a three-hour time limit for the pay-per-view, they weren't able to put up the some of the video packages, but I think they should have just cut the show down to like eight or, or seven matches at maximum. Nine is a little too much for the show because like the first three matches were dick for time big time, but uh, other than that, I think the rest of the show is pretty good. So I do recommend checking this one out as you'll see by the star ratings in the description. So let me breeze through this as quickly as possible. Already about a two minutes in. And uh, if you hear me sneeze, I apologize. It's because I have a little bit of allergies. Uh, but let's begin. Uh, go. So to open up, so we had hour one, which was basically like their pre show, which they aired on YouTube. I didn't see it, but uh, you did have a four corner survival, one by Brian Johnson defeating Danhausen, LSG. And Eli Isom and Shane Taylor Promotions retained the six-man tag team championships against Mexa Squad. And as a result of the uh, of the loss, they agreed between the three of them to have a triple threat match on the pay-per-view. Which that definitely got me excited when I learned about it on Twitter. Um, then we get the main show. And uh, first up we get Ken uh, Kenny King defending the television championship as a replacement for Dragon Lee against Tracy Williams. Part of the LFI versus... Um, What's it called? Uh, La Facción Ingobernable Foundation feud. And this was okay. Um, for those who don't know, Kenny, or not Kenny King, uh, Dragon Lee, unfortunately, he went through a uh, surgery on his knee. And because of the result of the surgery, he wasn't able to compete on the pay per view. So Kenny King filled in for him on this matchup. And since uh, Dragon Lee was also one half of the tag team champions with Kenny King, uh, Dragon Lee's father, Bestia del Ring, who's also part of the, of the group, was going to replace him in the tag title match later on. So we'll get to the, around to that one in a little bit. But this was an okay match. It was just dick for time. It was way too short at like 7 minutes. They should have gone like 12 minutes or something like that. It was just way too short. It looked like they were about to get on a roll here. But then uh, they went right for the finish. So Amy Rose, who's the manager of the group, threw in the belt into the ring. Um, Tracy and Kenny saw the belt. They were like trying to fake each other. Or no, they were trying to go for the belt. But... Uh, Tracy faked him out, grabbed him, and hit him with the pile driver to win the championship. Great finish. Tracy finally won the TV championship. I was really happy for Tracy. Even if he only won the tag team championships later in the night, I was just really glad that Tracy won the belt. But I'll get around to the whole double champion thing later on. Um, but an okay match, but just way too short. Then you had um, Mark Briscoe versus Flip Gordon, which was okay. It was pretty decent for the time that it went, but again, just dicked for time. Um, Should have gone like 10 minutes, would have worked fine as the opener, but it was okay. Um, some good spots here and there, but nothing spectacular. I will say, though, there's kind of a complaint I had with this ma uh, with the first like three matches. All three either ended in screwy fashion or had like a screwy moment like interference or blow blow or what have you. Uh, in the first three matches, back to back to back, I think they should have spaced it out throughout the card instead of like doing it all back to back. So you kind of had some screwy finishes throughout the night, uh, which is kind of a complaint, especially since uh, Flip hit a low blow on Mark and Kenny hit a low blow on Tracy, but wasn't able to pick up the victory. Um, Flip Gordon was able to hit it and then hit the flip five for the victory. But this was a decent matchup. So aside from that complaint, uh, this match was decent. Then you had Josh Woods taking on. Uh, Dalton Castle, which was a good match. Nothing spectacular here, just a good, solid wrestling match. The main story of the matchup was, uh, 
what's his name, Silas Young was at ringside, who is uh, Josh's tag team partner and sort of a mentor of sorts. He kept telling him, uh, follow my lead and, try, and told him to try to use a chair for a spot. Josh refused. And because of that, uh, Silas basically turned heel, hit him with the chair, screwing him out of the match. Cuts a promo on him and saying, you're about to get an ass whipping in the future when you, when you deny me again. And basically, tease, he's going to go back to the last real man gimmick in the future. I'm perfectly fine with this. Um, Silas Young, I always thought, was a much better uh, heel than he was a babyface. But I like that when he was a babyface with Josh Woods. He was never really full-blown babyface. He was just... Um, he just kept kind of the mannerisms and his behavior of the heel. Um, like more... No like kind of like a straight man, I guess, uh, to Josh's antics. But... Yeah, um, good matchup here. I'm interested to see where this feud goes. Uh, it should be good. Uh, then we had the... Alright, this is where the show picks up. So we have Jay Briscoe versus EC3. I heard the video package was really good that they aired on TV. I'm really interested to see how they play out the story. But yeah, I wasn't looking forward to this matchup that much. But I thought it could have been a good matchup. And yeah, that's what it was for me. A really good match. Not a great one. I think it went a little too long. Around 20 minutes. This should have gone like 15, maybe 17 at maximum. Because uh, it did drag at certain points by the end. But it was a good solid wrestling match from two solid workers. So I couldn't really have asked for much more from them. And they delivered what they needed to. Um, just some good physical spots. Including a pretty vicious Death Valley driver on the ring apron. And uh, EC3, his goal of trying to figure out if Honor was real. And the finish was pretty good where EC3 extended his hand for a handshake. Jay accepted. And then he picked him up and ended with the Jay Driller to pick up the victory. Yeah, really good match. Really enjoyed it. A little too long and it did drag at certain points. But I enjoyed it. And I'm interested to see which direction both guys go from here. Because EC3, I don't really see him as like a Ring of Honor guy. But hopefully he's able to fi fine tune his character more and more. Um, if he's going to be, like, part of the company, because I saw he did sign with Ring of Honor, so I'm interested to see what they do with him in the company. Hopefully they use him better than what WWE did for the two years that he was there, but yeah, uh, should be interesting, and uh, I'm pretty sure Jay's going to go back to tag team stuff with Mark unless he wants to go after the world title again, uh, but we'll see that in the future. Then we had the unsanctioned match, uh, Matt Taven versus Vincent. This was decent. Um, this was basically a cinematic match where they were fighting around in this one building in Boston. Uh, I think it was. Their, I think they said it was their tr old training facility where they first met. So kind of going back to the uh, to the roots, kind of similar to what um, NXT did with uh, or, uh, with Gargano and Champa with one final beat where they went back, kind of went back to the beginning of sorts. Um, this was obviously not as good as that. Uh, the presentation here, there was no music, no commentary. So it's just basically the dialogue between the two and the sounds of them writhing in pain you had throughout the match. Um, I think this should have just been a regular fight without honor in, uh, in the building. But I guess because, um, in kayfabe, they didn't want the violence to spread any more than it already was. Because uh, I believe there was a segment they did a few weeks ago where they, um, basically hobbled um, Bateman's leg, similar to what they did, uh, to Mike Bennett at Final Battle, so, yeah, um, so it's just between the two, it was okay, um, there were a couple brutal spots, including the finish, uh, there was also a, a spot where Taven went for a tope suicida through the ropes and hit a ladder that was leaning up against the wall, the finish was a little unsatisfactory, if this is the end of the feud, this was basically kind of a flat way to end it, because they were on this balcony in the main center of the, of the building, and then this big dude knocks both of them off, and then he goes down stairs to pick up uh, Vincent and leaves Taven there hurting, uh, writhing in pain. So, yeah, kind of a flat finish, and that just came out of nowhere for me. Maybe I'm just missing some context for the feud. But other than that, it was an okay matchup, but definitely one of the weaker matches of the show. Then we had an in-ring segment with Quinn McKay bringing out Maria Kanellis, who announces that there's going to be a women's championship tournament this upcoming summer. And then out comes uh, the allure of Mandy Leon and Angelina Love. Angelina's giving Maria some shit, saying, I should be the women's champion, blah, 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 blah. And then there was a funny line where she said, what position got you into this position? Kind of a funny line, even though it kind of doesn't fully make sense because Maria's married. And there's no way that t uh, Bennett has some sort of connection with Ring of Honor in terms of, like, uh, backstage in the office, unless he secretly is, but... 
other than that, kind of a funny line. And then Maria announces that because of the fact that you were out for the second half of the year because of your attack on Quinn uh, McKay, um, which is a feud I really don't care about and I haven't been following that much, but it's going to be good to see Quinn finally get in the ring because uh, she said that um, uh, if, what's it called? She booked the match between Quinn McKay and Angelina Love for TV, and if Angelina wins the match, she gets a buy in the first, gets a buy past the first round of the tournament. Um, so yeah, it should be interesting in terms of story how they um, how they conclude the feud because I know that these two have been feuding like um, in their various segments on social media and Ring of Honor, but I don't really care about it that much. But I'm interested to see how they blow it off. Um, well, yeah, as far as the women's championship thing, I don't know. I'm kind of mixed on it. Like, on the one hand, like, the women's division was kind of a failure for Ring of Honor. It was definitely one of the least interesting things that the company did, and it did not turn out that well, and the whole Kelly Klein situation kind of buried the division. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look it up on YouTube, go look it up on Twitter, or anywhere on the internet. You'll find information there, but... Yeah, hopefully they'll able they're able to get a good crop of talent that's unsigned with the company or or, or talent that isn't really available, uh, that isn't signed to another company. So yeah, hopefully they're able to get some good talent and do a good job like they did with the Pure Title Tournament. Hopefully, uh, then we have uh, the match of the night: Jonathan Gresham defending the ROH Pure Title against uh, Dak Draper. Great match here. Uh, I haven't seen too much of Dak Draper before, but I think Gresham did a really great job of carrying him in this matchup, um, selling for him uh, with with his submission holds and uh, the uh, the bear hug he delivered throughout a majority of the first half of the match, trying to take trying to work on the sternum of Gresham. Just good psychology throughout the matchup. I really really enjoyed this one. Again, easily the match of the night. Just really enjoyed this one. Gresham's psychology, his storytelling, and his technical ability. He's just on fire right now. He's without a doubt the best wrestler Ring of Honor has right now. And I kind of said it on Twitter a few weeks ago that uh, I think it was in celebration of Gresham's birthday where I said, uh, happy birthday to the face of Ring of Honor right now, Jonathan Gresham. And I do think he is because with the whole with the success of the pure title tournament um, and him really doing a great job with the title, the last few months, uh, Gresham really has been the MVP of Ring of Honor right now. So, yeah, and yeah, and this was a great match. Good performance from Draper, but Gresham really carried him in this matchup. Some good spots in this matchup, including the finish where Gresham hit a tope suicida, landed on Draper's back, and locked in a sleeper hold. And I love the call from uh, Caprice Coleman where he said, uh, you might want to call that a tope to a sleeper. And I forgot to mention earlier that Rocky Romero was brought in for commentary, which was awesome. Always been a big fan of Rocky Romero on commentary in New Japan. So it was really refreshing to bring him in for this pay-per-view. Uh, anyway, the finish was cool. He hits the tope to a sleeper. Draper tries to get him off of his back, and then he finds the strength to get back into the ring. But because of the because the three rope breaks um, were used up by both men, he eventually passed out from the sleeper. And Gresham retained the championship. Great match here. Really enjoyed this one. Uh, it, it, it flew by pretty quickly. It was like 20, 22 minutes, something like that. But yeah, it, it flew by really nicely. So great match here. Definitely the match of the night. Then we have the ROH World Tag Team Championship match. The champions, uh, La Facción Gobernable of Kenny King and Bestia del Ring defending against uh, Tracy Williams and Rhett Titus. Of the foundation good match here i do think dragon lee could have helped make this matchup a lot better he would have also had a i'm pretty confident he would have had a really good match with tracy williams for the tv title so it was a shame that because of the surgery he wasn't able to compete but they did announce that um once dragon lee's uh cleared to compete he's going to get the first shot at both the tv title and the tag team titles which i'm really happy about because dragon lee has been like a breath of the fresh air in ring of honor the last couple years um, the match was good, fast-paced, tag team wrestling, some decent spots, nothing spectacular, but just a nice little breather before the main event. And uh, in the end, Amy Rose threw a chair into the ring to try to give to Bestia the ring. Bestia was pissed about it, like, throw it to me properly. And then out of nowhere, I can't remember who it was, I think it might have been uh, Rhett Titus. He grabbed him and then he put him in the full Nelson lock and sat on his back. Bestia submitted, and they won the championships. Uh, really happy for Red Titus to win the championships here with uh, Tracy Williams. I really do think these two guys can really help the tag team division. But I think the question is, like, why would you do three or two champ tag team championship um, changes within the course of a couple months? Because uh, 
Dragon Lee and uh, Kenny King beat Gresham and Lethal uh, last month in March. I think, I think like in late February, early March, they beat him for the championships, and then they immediately lose him to Tracy and Rhett Titus. I don't know why they did that, but I'm not going to complain about it right now. Uh, so the post-match, we saw Kenny King and uh, Amy Rose go have an argument. She flips him off. They try to calm... He tries to calm things down and then eventually unleashes Bestie on him, hitting him with a, hitting her with a spear, basically kicking her out of the of the group since she screwed up in both of the title matches. So I don't know with what direction this is going to go. And plus, I kind of find it hilarious that um, there has been no real criticism of this angle of uh, Bestia hitting the spear on Amy Rose since. Uh, the whole controversy a couple weeks ago at the New Japan Cup final where Osprey hit B Priestley with the Oz cutter in the post match. So, I, and to me, I do think one of these two, maybe both of them, will end up being swerves. But the whole man on woman violence thing, I'm not going to go into a whole debate about it. All I'm going to say is that uh, I don't want to say people are hypocritical about it. I'm just going to say that um, the lack of conversation around this. Compared to the Ospreys thing, is kind of hilarious. But other than that, um, yeah, decent angle here. Nothing really to talk about. And then the main event, probably my most anticipated match of the night. Uh, Roosh defending the ROH World title against uh, Jay Lethal. The only concern I really had going in this matchup wasn't really the time or anything, but it was more like that I really was hoping that Roosh would win the championship, or Roosh would retain the championship and beat Lethal clean. Because, you know, Lethal... He's lost clean before, so I don't think he would have. Uh, it would have been that much of a problem for Lethal to put him over clean or anything. But for the most part, yeah, it was a clean matchup. You kind of have a formula with Roosh matches, from what I've seen, where early on Roosh kind of dominates and just uh, goes to the outside, beats the shit out of his opponent, and then um, the babyface makes a comeback. But I like that they kind of had more of a um, wrestling-based sort of uh, story going on between the two. Jay Lethal trying his best to out wrestle Roosh and working on his knee throughout the match so it kind of made it a little bit more refreshing and uh, it was a really good match I, I think this was on its way to being a great match I'm going to give it three and three quarter uh, I would say it's close to borderline four stars but I'm going to go three and three quarter with this one um, gratefully they saved the LFI interference for the end but I really do think that Roosh needs that one pure clean uh, win even if he does get a little bit aggressive you know with uh you know, using shit at ringside instead of relying on interference because I was not a fan of the interference that final battle when they used it on Brody King, but it kind of made sense there. Here, it doesn't really make sense that much to me personally, but uh, yeah, LFI came out to try to interfere. Bestia hit uh, Jay Lethal in the back with the chair when he tried to go for the lethal injection. Todd was going to make a disqualification call, and I like the callback to a segment they did earlier in the night where uh, Jay Lethal was was pleading with Todd to try to make the right decision within the match, uh, not allow LFI to screw over, um, screw the match over, uh, and then Roosh uh, capitalized and hit two. Uh, you get the bull, you get the horn. You mess with the bull, you get the horns drop kicks, which is a pretty vicious finisher, I will say. Uh, and in the end, Roosh retained the championship. Post match, we saw them beating down uh, the foundation. And then out came Brody King for his return, brings out Tony Deppin, and then out from behind uh, the other side of the ring came Homicide and Chris Dickinson to form this new found, uh, this new group in Ring of Honor, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, it's pretty cool to see Homicide back in Ring of Honor, and I thought it was awesome to see Chris Dickinson in Ring of Honor. We've never seen him there before, I believe, and uh, forms this new group to go up against uh, LFI. But they also have started, it looks like they're going to start a feud as well with the Foundation as they attacked uh, Jay Lethal after the match. Uh, I'm guessing they're going to go by the name Violence Unlimited. I remember there was a promo um, sort of teasing this a couple weeks ago, but I did not expect this to happen on the pay-per-view. Uh, there was also rumor as well that maybe Andrade was going to be coming in to Ring of Honor uh, to uh, participate with LFI. I think it would have been a good opportunity. Uh, I'll talk about that another time, though. But kind of sad Andrade didn't go to Ring of Honor. But yeah, a good way to end the pay-per-view. And yeah, a good way, a good pay-per-view all around. Uh, not perfect, but it was uh, pretty good for the most part. First three matches I do recommend skipping. But I would say every, pretty much everything from uh, Jay Briscoe uh, versus EC3 all the way to the main event was pretty good. Uh, 
Briscoe EC3 was really good. The triple threat. Ah, oh, fuck me. I forgot. I completely forgot another match. The triple threat between Bandito, Fulmina, and Ray Horace. Really good match. Uh, not much else I can really say about it. Um, looks like the group is split up. But yeah, good stuff. Uh, that triple threat match was really good. The unsection match was fine. Nothing spectacular. Kind of a flat way to end the feud if that's going to be the way they're going to go. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Uh... The pure title match was great, and the main event was really good. The post-match of the main event was really good as well. I just hope that they, that this is just the main three core groups that they're going to go with, and they don't do like a faction warfare or a uh, like a gang riot type of thing that WWF did in 97, where you have so many stables in the company. So, yeah, hopefully it's just to, between the three groups. But overall, uh, really good pay-per-view. I do recommend checking it out. Uh, and until next time, guys, peace.